listening to the Ones Ready Podcast, a team of Air Force Special Operators forged in combat with over 70 years of combined operational experience as well as a decade of selection instructor experience. If you're tired of settling and you want to do something you truly believe in, you're in the right place. Now here's your host, PJ team leader, jujitsu lover, meme enthusiast, and dad joke aficionado. Aaron Love. Welcome back, everybody. Once again, in the team room with the with the squad minus Trent. Trent's out in the wilderness doing SR stuff. Don't ask about it. We can't tell you, and he won't do it anyway. We're back here in the team room. We have a really, really good one for you. We brought in our good friend, RJ Casey. He's going to talk about his, his diverse experience and his crazy career. I actually was telling him before we started recording, I was like, holy cow, even, even I learned something about you, and we've been friends for a while. So we want to say thanks to him uh, for being here. Of course, we're going to start by saying thanks to you guys. And gals out there in the comment section, liking, following us, subscribing, engaging. It's been awesome. Thanks very much. You guys keep doing it. Keep finding those like-minded individuals that you can connect with in the comment section. Talk about your training plans and, and follow us on, on all of our spots. Go on over to onesready.com and check out our partners page. So it's one, onesready.com slash partners. That's a whole bunch of people. Again, we don't get any money from this, but it's people that we like and that we support. And we want you guys to know about them and their brands. And then they're almost all veteran or LEO operated businesses that we want to see do well and uh and they've helped us along the way too about getting the word out about runs ones ready so go over to onesready.com the partners page and uh check out put ones ready in at almost all of their checkouts and it's a sweet discount pretty much everywhere you go so man now that that's out of the way rj what's up brother thanks for coming on man hey no thanks for having me on um <clears throat> i think we talked a little before you hit record and uh, the, the resources that you're giving these kids out there is phenomenal. Um, I don't think any of us had this and certainly not 10 or 20 years ago when we were all getting in this business, it's, uh, it's pretty amazing for you guys to put it out all there. I mean, the kids obviously still have to take the test, but, uh, to be as prepared as they can be and as, as getting that leg up that you're giving them, that's amazing. So I appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks, man. Uh, we, we appreciate that. We like to think we're trying to do the, the righteous thing out here. So it's good to get that feedback, man. We, we appreciate it. Usually, uh, usually we start off with some kind of like, hey, just tell us about yourself and just go into your history. We are not going to do that with you because I want to I want to like guide through this because there was so much to get through. Um, we'll start okay. off with this. So the reason on is, is you're a crow, right? Tell us about, you know, your current assignment, what you're doing just right now. And then we're going to we're going to start peeling these onion uh, layers back and get to the, the soft, mushy center. OK, uh, so I'm a crow with the 308th Rescue Squadron out of Patrick Air Force Base. Uh, it's a pretty iconic team in, in that, uh, it's right there near Cape Canaveral. So all this space craziness that's going on right now and the explosion for, uh, space force and space exploration, uh, establishing a space station on the moon and, and traveling on to Mars and getting that going. It's, it's pretty dynamic right now. And, uh, I feel pretty lucky to be on this team. Yeah, absolutely. And for, for those of you that don't know, like all of the launches that happen out of Florida, you know, the Coco team is almost co-located. I mean, it's right down the road. So naturally those guys are kind of the subject matter experts, but that wasn't your first assignment as a, in the rescue community, right? Like you had a PJ assignment before that, right? Yeah, actually I was with the uh, New York team out on strong Island. So one Oh third, they are <laughs> awesome. Uh, <laughs> tactical rock stars. Uh, I think of all the teams, the RQS is, um, I just had a blast in New York. Uh, they had a lot of guys with a Marine recon background. Um, by the time I left, there was probably five Ranger tasks to include mine. Uh, so it was a pretty strong tactical team. I unfortunately wasn't there as much as they wanted me to be. Um, I was traveling as a civilian and deploying uh, five to eight months out of the year with them. But I, I managed to make it through my weird pipeline, uh, just coming from special forces and, uh, so I got that under a year. Um, yeah, it worked out pretty good to be on that team for a couple of years. I was there for about four years. Um, yeah. So well, so it was and, and this really is exactly cool why to the Air Force. Yeah, and this is exactly why I didn't want to have you just go back to the beginning. So just in the, that quick little blurb right there. So Ranger Tab, Special Forces, PJ, and a Crow. We're gonna go all the way back now. Now that people can kind of see into the into the uh into the depth of what we're going to start talking about here man take take it all the way back go back all the way and no kidding hit us at the beginning of the, your chronological career you were at N N M M I, which is a, a military institute essentially it's a, a military college right so man right. I, 
Yeah. You may or may not have had a little hiccup, had a had a kind of a non-standard progression there. Why don't you hit us off with your academy career and start from there? Yeah, definitely not an academy, but the uh, New Mexico Military Institute, uh, NIMI, uh, that was a really good foundational um, place for me to start. Uh, prior to that, I was an Air Force brat. So my dad flew five different generation jets uh, in the Air Force, a couple tours in Vietnam and as a kid, all his friends would be like, well, what do you want to be when you grow up, RJ? I was like, fighter pilot. And um, <laughs> there was uh, something uh, that happened. My dad went to an accident board and he came back and it was just weird timing. I was a teenager. Um, we were, he was stationed over in Bitburg, Germany, which that base isn't even open now. But they were flying F-15s and uh, there was an accident in Spain. So he came back from that and I said, so dad, you know, what, what, what caused the accident? He goes, well, it wasn't pilot error. And I was like, what does that mean? <laughs> and hmm. uh, he said, well, it was a, it was a device on the plane and, you know, it wasn't a pilot error. Um, it was a malfunction of a piece on the F-15 and they're going to straighten that out. So we got to the bottom of it. It took us a while, but something in my developing brain at that point uh, as a teenager was like, man, I do not mind dying for my country, but I want it absolutely to be my fault. I don't want it to be some gasket somewhere that, that didn't do its job. So uh, about that same time over there, um, the only Air Force, uh, actually the only English speaking channel was the AFN. So they have these dumb commercials and, uh, and I hear a lot of people, why'd you get in? Oh, I saw Black Hawk Down, I want to be a Ranger. Well, I actually saw a commercial about Special Forces and it was guys coming out of the water, jumping out of planes. They'd show this field, and all of a sudden, a guy would stand up in the middle of it, and you're like, "Where did he come from?" You know, so he came out of nowhere. Uh, he materialized yeah. from the mist, from the depths. Yeah, that was always the awesome um, commercial with the seal the was depths. the footprints yeah. from right. the ocean or whatever. Oh like, man! And then yeah. the sea would come up, and it would wash us. Yeah, the footprints and you're like, away. "What just happened? Get out of here, bro! That's a whole so cool. squad of goons on your on your shoreline." <laughs> So I see this commercial within a, probably a week of having that conversation with my dad. And I was like, that's what I'm going to do. That looks so awesome. So um, at the end of the commercial, there was a, you know, a recruiter at the end. Hey, if you're interested, call this number. So I'm, I'm, I, I hadn't even hit puberty yet. And I'm calling this number. And, and uh, the guy on there was like, well, now, son, how old are you? And, you know, hey, we like our guys to be smart. <laughs> you, you know, we need you to graduate high school. And this guy was super quick on his feet. He's like, hey, you're calling me. Where are you? And I said, I'm in Bitburg, Germany. He goes, are you on base housing? I was like, yeah. And he goes, go to your kitchen, grab some mail, give me your address, and I'm going to send you a book list. And as you're going through high school, you can read about us. If you're still interested, after you graduate, come on over. So I actually read a lot of the books on that list. And, and the more I read, the more I was just fascinated. Like, how can they take a kid from high school and he's doing minor surgery as an SF medic, you know, and mm. some of the missions I read about in the Congo and it was just fascinating to me. And so, um, as I'm about to graduate high school, we were at Langley air force base for my senior year. And, uh, you know, it had been cooking in my brain for a couple of years and I started calling recruiters and there was a two, two year airborne ranger contract. And I was like, that's what I want to do. And my dad started getting nervous as these recruiters are, you know, knocking on the door after an ASFAB. And uh, he goes, hey, RJ, your mom and I have never really asked you for anything. Um, you want to go to the military. We want you to go to school. Uh, I know you want to be in special forces. You know, instead of being two years with the Rangers, why don't you go to New Mexico military and you can be in the special forces guard? And I was like, huh, I didn't really think about that. And uh, I said, well, I'll, I'll – I'll start at NIMI, but if it's not a good fit, I'm going to sign that contract and I'm going to enlist. And he goes, fair enough. That's all I ask. Give it a shot. So, so I finished this ROTC basic camp. I come back and I'm like, go to the recruiter. And he's like, uh, Hey, we're, I'm going to read through every page of this contract It's guaranteed airborne ranger. Uh, it's yours to lose. So you get injured, all bets are off, you know, and he, he's actually a pretty good recruiter. Uh, and, and gave me the pros and cons of what I was about to sign. And right as I was about signing, he goes, this is going to sound really weird. And I've only done this twice, but I'm going to have you go home and sleep on it. And you come back in the morning, we're going to go through this contract again. So, you know, I didn't switch the paperwork or anything. 
you can sign it then if you still feel the same way. And I was like, why are you doing that? He goes, I don't know. I just get these feelings every once in a while. So I'll see you tomorrow morning. First thing I'm like, all right. So sure enough, slept on it. Couldn't wait to sign that. And the phone rings as I'm leaving the house. And it was somebody from Nimi saying, Hey, you really did good at, at, at basic. Um, we're, we want to offer you a two year, uh, ROTC scholarship. Everything's paid for. I was like, <laughs> I can't turn down free college. Holy crap. Like, yeah, exactly. Ah. You know, and so, it's the parents yeah. too. Like your parents always wanted you to go. Like you're like, oh, oh man, like everything. It's sucks. weird when the universe lines stuff up like that, right? Like you're like, this guy, te- he tells me he never lets anybody sleep on it. Then I sleep on it. Then I just happen to get this call. You're like, okay, I, I get it. All right. Uh, apparently I'm supposed to do this. So, all right. Yeah, okay, props fine. to that recruiter. Yeah. He, yeah. He was really cool. He said he'd only done it three times. And I actually went there and I told him the story. He just started laughing. He goes, man, I, I knew something was, should be different for you. But anyways, uh, I get to Nimi. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're really good. It was a really good foundation. Uh, I find a group, a small group of like-minded people led by uh, my first military mentor um, at the time, Captain Gilbert Alvarado. I still talk to him. In fact, I'm supposed to uh, do a movie about Vietnam over in Asia next year, and I'm taking him with me. So small world story, but um, he taught us, he was a door gunner in Vietnam, and he worked a lot with infilling and exfilling teams. He went on a lot of rescue missions, uh, and he trained us for combat. He was one of the few guys in my military career that was like, I mean, when we're on a ruck run, he's yelling, the dogs are right on your ass. You better hurry up. You're going to miss x Like he, he, he was mentally back in Vietnam picturing what we're about to, in his mind, what we were going into. And he definitely trained us hard, man. It was really, it was a good experience. And uh, that set me up for success to go on to Special Forces School. And, and uh, after I graduated in EMEA, I went to second of the 19 Special Forces out of West Virginia. Um, a lot of guys, a lot of Vietnam vets, a couple of Grenada vets. Um, we just had a lot of experience on that team. And uh, it was a really cool place for me to start my military career. So from that selection, you know, from the first time that you're going to selection, because obviously you've been through a couple and we'll chronologically go through those as we continue to go, go along. But your first experience as a teenager, because a lot of people are like, well, I think I should probably wait until I'm, you know, mid twenties or a little bit older, more mature to go through. But as a teenager going through that kind of selection um, phase, was it extremely difficult or was it just everything was a slap in the face or what was that like for you? Yeah, it was, uh, it was definitely an adventure and I didn't know what to expect. It wasn't like I wasn't scared or I was overconfident. I was somehow, I kind of split the uprights. I remember a couple of events, um, and it wasn't even required for me to go to, uh, SFAS. Um, at the time I was going through the fourth test class, uh, and my unit really wanted me to go. They were like, RJ, you're an officer. Uh, you haven't been to ranger school. Um, you're fresh out of IOBC. You've never, you don't have any military experience. This, this course is going to be required in the future, but we want you to go for experience. Like you're going to get good at orienteering and land navigation. Uh, they're going to kind of touch on small unit tactics before you go to SF school. It's three weeks. It's, uh, it's called special forces orientation and training. And this is, uh, this is the fall of 1988. So it was a long time ago, kind of doing myself, but um, I went there and I had, I, I remember instructors saying, candidates, uh, you're going to pick up these logs. They were super monotone. They weren't, nobody yelled, nobody did anything. You either did it or you didn't. And that was it. Um, but they were like, Hey, see these logs over here. Each one of you are going to grab one. You're going to walk that way. You're going to follow all the signs, listen to instructors until we tell you to stop and time matters. So ready, go. <laughs> so I, I remember looking down at these logs and they were freaking huge. I don't think I could get my arms around it. And I was, I was 20 years old and, uh, I was just like, I don't know if I can pick that up much less walk with it. Like, really? I, I mean, he's telling me I can do it. Uh, I must Sarge, be able to do I it. I don't so, think I said this I stuff out loud. This, uh, <laughs> like, you know, this is heavy, right? Sarge, <laughs> quick question. Where do we get stronger? Are there smaller logs? Yeah. No. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, I already have 60 pounds on my back. Are you sure? Is this, this doesn't seem like a good idea. <laughs> no, but I literally, they would tell us to do something. I was like, ah, we must be able to do it. They're telling us to do it. So, okay. 
So I would kind of watch the experienced guys from Ranger Battalion. There was this one guy, Campbell, from 1st Battalion, and he was he was obviously one or two on every event. He was just a monster. And I would kind of see how he was attacking it and how he was rigging it in his ruck and how he turtle backed over and slowly stood up and started walking. And I was like, okay, I guess that's how you do it. So I learned a lot in those three weeks. And then uh, on the special forces school, I had um, in first phase, I remember uh, Dave Gallant, who was during the cold war was running guns across the, uh, the wall when it was still up and with 10th group. And, uh, he came into our hooch covered in sweat because he had rucked to work out at camp McCall. It's camp row now, um, broken nose, two black eyes, and he had a green beret on and he was just, I think he was still drunk actually, probably. Um, <laughs> But he got in a fight at this place called the Sugar Shack the night before. He might have done it on purpose and walked up. Somebody said, break my nose. I want to scare these kids. But he walked in and just started growling. And it was definitely different than the uh, orientation and training course. Uh, but he marched us out and threw his beret down. He goes, this beret doesn't mean shit. Like what you do every day, what you're doing right now, it doesn't matter what you did yesterday. You do your best all the time. And so Dave Gallant, legend, uh, hilarious i think he back then in the late 80s they drank a lot like there was a lot of alcohol and and crazy partying and stuff like that and i i some of my first humbling experiences was falling into some of that those traps but uh i learned a lot from the cadre i learned a lot from the other students uh everyone like i didn't even shave at that time he was the first guy to make me shave every day and he watched me do it with a dry razor um so i think that cued my puberty to actually kick in but uh yeah it was it was a pretty funny experience <laughs> i was everybody's little brother there and and uh, they'd be like hey kid come over here you know how to work this radio hey kid like let's see your weapon what was the last time you cleaned it this is how you clean it so um i grew up in a really what i consider to be very lucky as a very cool environment um so yeah, yeah. that's how i, I think one start. of I think uh, the important thing like you like you were talking about is just learning as you're a young guy. You don't know anything. So being able to admit like, hey, I don't know what I'm talking about. I'm going to look over here and pretend like I know what I'm talking about and see what that dude's doing over there. And as long as I copy that dude who has you know, had some experience at least and I'm wrong or whatever or we're both wrong together. But that's a big thing that you find in like selection and stuff. Um, yeah, sure. So you went from doing the, the Army thing and going to 18 Delta – and then you ended up skipping over or how did the physician assistant thing? Cause you became a physician yeah. assistant after, <laughs> after Actually, that. How did I, that. My plan. Uh, and you know, it's funny when you have these plans, they get derailed as soon as possible in really hilarious ways. Um, but going out of NIMI, I was in an early commissioning program. So when I went to my unit, I was a uh, eight, 11 alpha, which is an infantry officer after IBC. And after I graduated the Q course, they made me an 18 alpha, which is a special forces officer. So, so you um, actually, you start, so you started off as an, so hold on here. Yeah. So you went to NIMI. Did yeah. you go to ranger school first or yeah. after? Okay. Yeah. So that, so you went to 18, so you got through school and now you're an 18 alpha. Yeah. So now from 18 alpha, now where do you go? Yeah. So, uh, I went to the, I tried to go with my IOBC class to, um, ranger school with them. Uh, I just, there was a couple of former enlisted guys that were turned officers. Uh, two of them were ranger instructors. And uh, I was like, man, you know, and you, you're with these guys for four months. And uh, you're, so you're kind of a tight team. And that whole package is going to ranger school because that's their pipeline. They have to before they go on to the 82nd or some of the other units uh, in the infantry. Um, and I called back to my unit to try and arrange it. And uh, I was like, hey, you know, this, these guys know instructors, even without orders, I could take the PT test. If I pass, I'll call back and get orders from you guys. And they're like, nope, we're not paying for anything until you get special forces qualified. So forget it. You can go to ranger school after that. Ha ha ha. Like nobody after SF school goes to ranger school. Um, and so that's, I had to go to all through special forces training. Um, and then I was an officer. I was a ODA XO for a couple of years until I became, you know, a team leader, which for there is the ODA commander. Um, so it's a little different in the army, but you know, same 12 man structure, um, 
kind of like the seal platoons and 14 men, but we had a similar structure and yeah, it worked out really good. Um, because as an XO, that's when guys were taking me under the wing and Hey, I'm, we got to do this uh, medical scenario. You're going to be the patient. And then I want you to watch the medic. You're going to cover him, you know, and be like his shadow for the next month. Then I'm going to turn you over to the comms guys. You're going to be their shadow for a month. And, you know, every specialty on that operational detachment, there was always two guys coaching me through something. So for my first, you know, three or four years, it was all uh, going on trips and, and helping the uh, team leader out, but also, you know, drilling down on what those jobs really meant and uh, what those guys really did. So it was, like I said, it was a great place to start. Yeah. Um, and then after that, what made you want to transition into the PA? I know you kind of had a passion for helping people and stuff, but what was the, uh, the catalyst yeah. for that? Yeah, I, my plan was to be an 18 Alpha until I could try out for some of the other units um, and go on active duty. Uh, and then we were getting ready for a trip to Ecuador. And it was one of those days we were jumping, uh, getting ready for it. And it was at the end of a long day of jumping. And of course, if anyone ever says this, just they know. But it's like, hey, you guys, we got time for one more jump. I know we didn't plan it, but you know, the plane's still nope. waiting for us. Like, pass. Yeah. Just, nope. Say, hard just pass. Saying no. nope. That's it. No, I'm sorry. No, yeah. that, I, nope. That, that one more jump. That's the one. Yeah. That's, that's the, uh, you're nothing good is going to ca- happen on that last jump. Nothing good. So of course the jump master didn't check the winds and we were two miles off our spot. There was five of us. There were three concussions <laughs> and my right ankle. And I was at the top of a tree. I got blown into some wind. I got hit by two wind shears. The second one took me into some trees and the farmer that saw me fly into the trees estimated that I went in at least 50 miles an hour. And, uh, there was a guy who got killed earlier, years earlier. He got blown into some trees by a wind shear rapidly and he got a branch right through the sternum. So as I'm flying into the Mm. trees, I was like tight body position. You know, I did, I did everything I could under this canopy that was just screaming towards the trees. And, uh, you know, I came to a stop and I heard a loud snap and, you know, it was obviously a branch and it wasn't a branch. It was all my ligaments and tendons ripping perfectly in half all at the same time. Boom. So, um, I didn't just, I didn't break any bones, but, and I didn't just sublux my talus. I, uh, actually it was a total Taylor dislocation, which is a really freak accident. Usually your talus just comes off about halfway, but mine Cut, dropped and went to the side because uh, everything was ripped in half. So I basically I was in this tree and my body was kind of like that. So my feet were up here and my head was down here and I'm looking up. And as soon as I started to move, I wanted to throw up and pass out at the same time. I was like, okay, something's wrong. And I'm, I'm feeling head to toe. I'm like, what the hell? And I, and I moved my left foot to step on a branch below me. And that's when I'm staring at the sole of my boots. So I was like, okay, that's not good all right, uh, I got to climb out of this tree and crawl to the farmhouse. I think I remember where it is. It's not too far, and I need to get a ride back to the guys because nobody knows where I am. So that's exactly what I did. And uh, But basically, um, I had 11 months in therapy to think about. I knew I was going to walk normal again. Just in my brain, I was just like, no, nah, that's that." the surgeon who told me I would never walk normal again. I was like, man, why don't you worry about – just cutting, just do your freaking job and I'll worry about what happens after that. Okay. And then after 11 months of therapy, um, I had a lot of time to think. And one of the big things was, well, I know I'm going to walk again. I know I'm going to be in special forces again, but what if a breaching charge goes off early? What if I get hit by a car walking across the street? What if I'm in a wheelchair of all these really cool jobs in special forces? What can I do, uh, from a wheelchair? And, uh, so I just kind of went, pretty extreme. And I really love medicine. I just thought, you know, from reading books in high school to seeing what those guys really did on the ground, I just loved the whole medical thing. I just thought it was really cool that you can go out and do all these crazy missions. And it was your job to save life, not just, you know, do the the bad boy stuff. Um, I just thought it was really cool. So my plan was, as soon as I got healthy, I, I agreed to go on a couple of trips as a team leader. Um, And so I did all those trips and I set it up to where I would drop my commission 
and I would be in the first all brag 18 Delta course because they had shut the course down for a year. Um, so even if I wanted to switch, I couldn't right away. But uh, I timed it to where I had a week off. And then uh, after dropping my commission, turning all my gear in, signing back in as an enlisted guy, swearing in, getting orders for the 18 Delta course and starting the first all brag class. That was the summer in 96. So uh, it worked out perfectly. Uh, I came back off a trip with seventh group and um, signed in uh, as an enlisted guy, got my orders, drove my car that was packed down to brag to move down there for a year and and do the medical portion of the Q course. So it worked out really good, but that's why I, I did that at first drop. Well, well, Call me crazy. I mean, and I, I've just been sitting <laughs> sitting in the back kind of just listening and taking it all in. Um, so as a PA, I'd be willing to bet you had something happen or some interesting things, maybe some interesting places that you went to. Do you want to go into that? Uh, as far as being a PA, PA or an SF medic or both? Well, you know what? Either one. Whichever yeah. one is more interesting because I – I don't know, but I heard a little birdie told me that you've been some interesting places as a PA. Now, maybe that was an 18 Delta, but yeah, whatever you think is a legitimate story, yeah. go for it. No, I, I guess I'll go right away into the second transition here. So uh, as an 18 Delta, I went on a couple of trips uh, to the Middle East uh, and then a couple of training trips, and I freaking love medicine. Um, I just thought it was like I said, it was really cool. It was cool to go to these other countries and see how they did it. And after a couple of trips, my unit was like, hey, RJ, you're the only medic we have in college. Excuse me. Um, you, what do you think about PA school? And I had had other friends say, man, you really, you know, you keep saying med school, but you really need to look at the physician assistant uh, school. And the military has a great program. And from the guard, uh, it's, it's, pretty cool to get sent there because you're basically on active duty orders for two years to, you know, get your physician assistant school knocked out. And uh, the more I thought about it, the more I was like, you know, it, it is a lot faster education wise. You start making money right away. Um, you know, and I ended up doing that. So I dropped my PA packet after my second overseas trip as an 18 Delta. Uh, I got picked up, went to the, the uh, inner service physician assistant school, which congratulations, Brian, that's pretty awesome. I saw a John Courtright show and, uh, yep. yeah, it was really cool to see him go through that. Ironically, I was in the class ahead of him in the apprentice classes. He was finishing <laughs> the paramedic course. And, uh, because I had let my paramedic lapse, I had to sit for the exam again before I could graduate the apprentice course. Uh, in fact, they kind of freaked out. I didn't have a current um, paramedic license. So uh, while my team went to Florida, I dropped back into John's class. And there was a couple guys from New York, uh, like Rocco and Marty Vieira. And uh, yeah, I had a really good time studying for two weeks with those guys and getting tuned back up to take the national registry exam, which is not easy. Uh, I had been through PA school, the flight surgeon, he had just finished the, uh, his ER residency. And he goes, RJ, if I took the national registry right now, I wouldn't pass that. I was like, I know that test sucks. <laughs> I've taken it twice already. <laughs> Holy crap. I got to yeah. take it again. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, no, it was really cool to hear that you guys graduated, man. So congrats. It's not yeah, easy. It was, uh, not easy at all. Definitely not. Yeah. I remember I called you when I first, um, started just for advice and stuff. And you're like, well, it's going to suck for a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. get ready for the ride. I was like, uh -huh. yeah, but we've been through like in doc and stuff, right? He's like, yeah, it's a totally different type of suck. You're going <laughs> to, you're going to hate it for a little bit, but it's worth it. <laughs> oh yeah. And, and your friends are going to call you for trips. And like I had one of my best friends, Randy Rose, he was like, uh, he was a team sergeant on five, three, five. And, uh, he was like, RJ, we need a medic. It's in Charmel shake. It's closed circuit diving. We're teaching, you know, Middle Eastern guys, we're only going to work half days. This is going to be awesome. Six months, you got to come. And I'm in PA school. I'm in my first mm -hmm. semester just wondering when they're going to kick me out because it was so brutal. Um, <laughs> there was no pictures in any of the books, not that first semester anyways. So it was That's all I look forward brutal, to. <laughs> brutal, man. But uh, yeah, no, ha having gotten through that, uh, PA school, 
I, I didn't understand it at the time. Had I gone the MD route, there's no way I would have been able to do all the things I wanted to do, which as a PA, I was able to do. Um, like when you join some of the agencies, if you're a, a doctor, you're way too valuable to go forward and to be on an FOB. If you do, you're there for like a day to, to make sure the clinic's okay and to check in with the medic there or the PA there. And then you're going back to the embassy. So, but as a PA, you're on all these ground and, and water projects and it was just really cool. And I, it couldn't have worked out better. Uh, I just always seem to be in the right place at the right time. And I, I guess I was open to a lot of different things uh, and not, I'm, I'm focused, but I always have my eyes and ears open for different things. And uh, it just worked out for me to take that PA education and go up to Northern Virginia and travel a lot. And uh, I had a really great time. That, that was the best job I ever had. So um, I got recruited out of South America. I was with that C-Star package with DynCorp when, you know, Plan Columbia was actually going forward before those, um, before 9-11. And uh, I was down there for a couple of years. And that's where I got my foundational CSAR education. Um, and then uh, I got recruited to start doing ground and water projects. And, uh, and it was post 9-11 by about a year. And um, like I said, I was in the right place at the right time. I talked to the right people. Uh, and I just kept chasing stuff down. Um, that sounded interesting to me and it just worked out. Yeah. Well, one of the characteristics that we've kind of identified on this podcast through all the guests, but then also within ourselves is that it's never good enough. I mean, you, you can be content and happy with where you're at, mm -hmm. but it's still never good enough. And so, you know, we always try and challenge ourselves and you didn't stop with PA either. Uh, you decided to then go through another selection, i.e. Yeah. NDOC at the time. <laughs> oh, my God. I, I, Brian, Aaron, you guys would have laughed your asses off had you seen me show up to NDOC. I, so I was – so I'm in Iraq. I can, now, let, like, let, let's just pause. So you show up to NDOC day one. Me as an instructor, I walk out. There's a guy standing in front of me that is a Ranger qualified prior 18 Alpha, then 18 Delta, then like yeah. <laughs> jump, jump master, like but like working downrange, like going, living in Bogota, like coming back. Like at this point in your career, you are the worst possible <laughs> student because the second that those bona fides start getting laid out, every instructor in the room is like, Oh God, I hope I didn't say anything to this guy. That's like, this guy's more experienced than I am. This is the worst. Oh, it, it was a, it was kind of a pretty funny scene in 2003. Um, and I, and it was funny watching Nate's, uh, podcast with you guys, Nate Cox, <laughs> because he was one of my apprentice course instructors. But when I showed up to Indoc, like literally here's my advice that I got. Um, I signed in in New York between civilian trips I find myself in, we had just opened up Mosul. We, we'd been in a QC during the war phase. And then my whole ground team had been there since like September. So they were ready to get home to their families. I got there two weeks before the first bombs dropped um, that spring. And so as soon as the war phase was over, they were like, peace out. We are going home. And, uh, and I got a call. Hey, RJ, you haven't been there as long as the other guys. Uh, we're trying to open up Mosul. Do you mind hanging out for another couple months? And I was like, okay, what's a couple months? And they're like, we'll, we'll call you in a month or two with a better idea of what that <laughs> might look like for you. But, you know, if you can, literally hold, just hold, hold, right hold what you got. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> hold what, hold hold what you got. We'll get back to you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so I go up to Mosul and I'm up there and uh, we've got some green guys that came up, a recce element came up to join our ground team. And uh, there's three of my favorite people over at that unit. One is a retired sergeant major named Will Harris. He dragged me kicking and screaming through ranger school. And we just kept in touch. And he's just a great friend. I, in fact, I just saw him in Florida. He was visiting, visiting his son in Orlando um, last week, actually. Um, and then the Hefner brothers. The Hefner brothers started out in 2nd of the 19th out at Camp Dawson. And uh, the oldest brother went to first group 
for a tour before he tried out and his brother stayed in the 19th and then they both ended up, you know, going through selection and making it. Uh, so one of like, uh, when the green element walked up to us, they were like, Hey, you know, Hey, I'm Sergeant so-and-so and I'm, I'm the, uh, NCOIC of this team or this element. Uh, nice to meet you. Uh, what do we got? You know, I was like, Hey, uh, is Will Harris with you guys? And he goes, no, no, he's still at the Capitol. And I was like, and I, and I thought one of the guys was blonde and uh, he looked like Ryan, the younger brother, the Hefner brother. And uh, I said, uh, either of the Hefner brothers. And he goes, and so right behind him was this blonde guy that I thought might be Ryan, but he, he was thinner. Like Ryan was yoked back in the day. And I guess with all the endurance stuff he did over at green, he slimmed down quite a bit. So he goes, which one? And he had on these, we all had on sunglasses. And uh, I said, which one? Oh, God, I hope you brought Mike because Ryan, that mofo. And he goes, RJ, <laughs> is that you? I was like, holy <laughs> shit, I thought that was you. So I got to hang out with him for a couple months. And uh, yeah, it was uh, when we got plussed up with a troop um, and that wreck element, there was a guy named Scott Yelly. And he was, I kept asking, Hey, is there any PJs on your team? Is there any PJs attached to you? Do you know if there's any PJs here? Cause I was, I knew I had 10 days off and then I was going to NDOC. So there was this guy named Scott Yelly and he was the only air force tape. Wait, hold on, hold on. So you're, you're in, yeah. you're in Mosul. You had 10 days off and you're going to NDOC and you're just looking around like, Hey, you're, t- you're going to try to talk to a PJ to try to figure this out. Everybody yeah. out there listening that's like, well, I don't know. I've don't got like that. six months at home with internet. <laughs> like this is, this is like overseas in 2002. Like cell phones didn't exist. <laughs> it wasn't, it wasn't a thing. And you're just trying to get some G2 on a course you're about to take. All right, cool. Yeah. I'll keep yeah. going. Sorry to interrupt. <laughs> no, you're good. So Scott, so first of all, you can imagine, you know, I'm a goatee and I'm with the unit I'm with at the time as a civilian. I go, Hey, uh, somebody told me you're a PJ. He goes, yeah. And I said, but you're in this, you know, army unit. And he goes, yep, I'm the only air force wearing guy. And, uh, he's like, you know, why do you ask? And I was like, well, I mean, after I finish this trip, I'm told I have 10 days off and I'm going to like in the summer, I have to go to NDOC. And he goes, who told you to say that to me? And I said, no, I, I really, I've got to go to, he goes, hold on a second. <laughs> you're on our team right now. And you're going to go back in time to NDOC? That doesn't even make sense. How the fuck is that possible? And I said, well, <laughs> I signed into the New York, New York Guard uh, right before I came out on this trip. And uh, yeah, I, I, I'm coming from the Army. So I don't have any Air Force training at all. And to be a PJ, I guess I got to go through some kind of pipeline with you guys. And he goes, holy shit, you really have to go to NDOC, don't you? And he just started laughing. And he goes, oh, my God, like, so what's your PT score in the Army? And I told him, and he goes, so diving, what, you know, would, do you have any experience? I was like, oh, I'm on a dive team, you know, back in 19th group. I'm a dive supervisor. He goes, where'd you go to dive school? I said, Key West. He goes, oh, my God, you're, you're fine. You're going to be drinking with the instructors by week four. Holy crap, you're going <laughs> to, no, no brainer, you're going to be fine. Dude, he went back (laughs) before Desert Storm, like in 90. So that's back when there was drinking at NDOC and the instructors were not shy about it. So, yeah, that was back in the day. Not when I went. I went in the summer of 2003, and it was not like that at all. I thought I would, I brought all my pre scuba fatigues, my BDUs, because we still had BDUs and black boots back then. Um, Mm -hmm. So, you know, when you're wearing tanks, that, that rip shoulder to shoulder, that was in every one of my, every one of my BDUs, New York, as I signed in, they were like, Hey, you don't have any uniforms with like E7 and AFSOC and name tapes. We're going to, we're just going to ship them down there for you. We'll get two uniforms ready with your sizes and we'll have them shipped down there for you. I was like, yeah, cool. That sounds great. You know, and I, I was thinking, why would I need that? This is a, you know, a SOCOM pre scuba. It's longer than ours, but <laughs> you know, I, I just had no idea what I was walking into. And I walked into the real military. Like that's the real air force uh, in 2003. I don't, 
I'm not sure how it is as you, you guys were instructors there, but we were like marching, like a hundred of us were marching right face forward march, like real military stuff. And it was hilarious because <laughs> I, I was the E7. <laughs> Officers didn't join us during the pre-phase. They joined us on day one of NDOC. And uh, so I was in charge of all these guys. And literally I was like, you know, a hundred plus guys in front of me. And I'm like, face that way, start walking, go. You know, I mean, literally. So that was day one. And then <laughs> just go, just go over there, just, nerds. Just go together. Start walking, and I'll tell you when to stop. And uh, all of you nerds, see that field over there? That's yeah, where we're going. That's where we're going. See the instructor who's really pissed right now. We're going to him. Um, <laughs> but finally, my military school kicked back in, and I got into marching. And I it, that two week prep course was probably one of the better things that ever happened to me because that switched me back onto what I needed to do as a a senior guy on my NDOC team. Uh, it, that prep course is good. huge. Yeah. Yeah, that prep course is huge. So you, you actually brought it up. Um, <laughs> so you're, you're a crow now. I think it's important to, you know, at least hit, you already had a degree, you were already an officer, and yet you still decided to enlist as a PJ. Yeah. Okay. What, so what drove that decision matrix? Okay. I jumped off that bridge because, um, after a couple of trips, uh, 19th and all the guard units in the army were getting spun up to deploy and they were all getting hit with minimum a year deployment. And a lot of them were getting hit with, Hey, you're getting extended six months. So my civilian job anticipating that I got out of my first one, uh, and they were like, RJ, you cannot be gone for 18 months. You can't even be gone for a year. You have to get out of the military. And I was like, well, uh, let, me, let me look around. I, I really like the, the reserving guard. I love the military. Let me just see if I can do something about this. So I went to PSYOPs. I went to civil affairs. Uh, they were all getting hit with a year deployment. So I was like, shit. So I ended up down in Columbia for a very short trip. Uh, in fact, in, in two, the spring of 2003, I think it was March, there was an airplane crash. So I was down there and we were at the crash site. And one of the guys there was a friend of mine, Rob Trexler. He was a former 18 Delta from 7th Group. And I'm telling him, man, my job's telling me I got to get out of the military. And you know, I guess I'm going to have to do that when I get back uh, before my next trip. And he goes, dude, why don't you just join the PJs? And the only thing I really knew about the PJs was they all jumped, they all dive. They didn't have like separate halo team, scuba team. You know, you didn't have to be in a medic slot. Like they all did all three of those things. And those were some of my favorite things besides shooting in the military. I was like, PJs. Yeah. I remember them, the recruiters coming around to the 18 Delta course, trying to, you know, dynamite in the lake and, and get some of the 18 Deltas to cross over to the Ar uh, air force and become PJs. Uh, and they were saying, you don't have to go to NDOC if you're dive qualified. Huh, PJs, PJs. Yeah, but they don't have Garden Reserve. He goes, the hell they don't. They got three squadrons of each. I was like, <laughs> I did not know that. So I started doing my homework. And uh, at the first team I interviewed was actually the Alaska team. And I can't remember the chief up there, but Chris Keene was up there and a guy named Jeff. And they walked me around the whole squadron. And uh, it sounded so freaking cool. That team's awesome. Like, that's another amazing mm -hmm. team. Um, just so many civilian rescues and so much experience. Like, every one of those guys has just got the most crazy resume. Uh, they're professional climbers or skiers or whatever. But, um, but that was a cool team. And when I went to the chief, uh, I basically, Chris was like, dude, you are in. You are like, we want you. Everyone on the team wants you. So last interview, you got to go talk to the chief. If he's good to go, we're going to sign you in today. You, are you good to swear in? I was like, hell yeah, this is awesome. <laughs> so I went and talked to the chief and uh, I thought he was screwing with me at first. He was like, uh, you know, how old are you again? And I said, um, you know, I'm th I think I was in my early 30s. And he goes, wow, that's kind of old. I was like, yeah, you know, whatever. I, I, at that point, I th really thought he was fucking with me. He goes, and you're in the army guard. That's a lot of paperwork. I don't know. I was like, Hey man, I, I'm, if I can be an asset to your team, I'm here to help. If not, I'll be on my way. You know, I'm not here to cause any problems. And he goes, yeah, I just think it'd be too much paperwork. I was like, I 
guess that's my cue. Like, I'm for real? Here. Is, that, is that yeah. right? <laughs> yeah. Is and that so I'm walking thing? out the door. This is like, the whole story? Okay. RJ, I got to be honest with you. This story uh, sucks. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'm leaving. I'm leaving. He's like, yeah. Yeah. Hey, good luck. Whatever you decide. <laughs> so I get out in the hallway and Chris is like, so can I swear? <laughs> Whatever you decide. How can I this works out you for you, fella. Yeah. See ya. Peace. So, Pretend uh, to close the door, walk back in. And you're like, ha you got me. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you had me there for a second. Uh, I went out to Chris. I was like, dude, I think I just failed that interview. I'm, I'm not going to be part of this, I don't think. And he goes, yeah, Chief's kind of weird. He's, he gets in these weird <laughs> moods and, and you can't even talk to him. I was like, if you want to check with him, if not, I'm going to call the New York unit. <laughs> and he goes, uh, let me talk to him. And he came out and he goes, yeah, call New York. I, I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> so, <laughs> Pass. Yeah. Just hard, yeah. hard pass. pass. What's, yeah. what's that resume close. look like? Nah. Pass. Nah. Mm-mm. So I went nah, up to New York today, and uh, they were, uh, that that was a route, like I said, I, I love the New York team. I'll never say enough about them. Uh, they didn't even take a stripe. They were like, hey, we need new blood at the E7 level. You've, you're Halo Jump Master, you're Dive Soup. You're, you know, you've got this SF-18 Delta background. You do civilian stuff. Oh my God, that's we, we couldn't ask for more of one of our E7s, so that would be great to mix it up at that level. So, yeah, come on in. So I, I did the PT test, and you know, and then about a week later, I ended up in Iraq with my civilian job, and then at Indoc eventually. But back to your Aaron being an instructor there. So the one instructor that I was that fully engaged me on that first day. And so all I'm, to be fair, I'm not wearing any tabs. I, I didn't want to draw any fire right out of the gate. So these were the most stripped down uniform I could have. But obviously E7 as an indoc student was not, that was kind of weird, right? Not so, common, yes. Yeah. yeah, and I'm wearing Air Force and the AFSOC thing. And uh, New York hooked me up with those uniforms, thank God. So anyways, uh, Dave Keaton was one of my indoc instructors. <laughs> yo, 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 Keaton. <laughs> yo, yo. <laughs> So he walks up <laughs> on the scene. I love that. And he that's goes, all you had to do. Like, if anybody yeah. says yo, yo, like every PJ yeah. in the world, yo, yo, yo. <laughs> yo, 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 yo. <laughs> you know who it is. Quick story. I yeah. may or may not have been, I yeah. may or may not have been at, a, at an establishment that also served food, but also served beer. And one yo, yo, Keaton looks at me and goes, yo, 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 Aaron, why does my ATM receipt look like a phone number? I was like, <laughs> I was like, yo, yo. Yo, yo. Uh, <laughs> What's that, up, Doc? Dude, he uses that line all the time. Yo, yeah. It's like, why hey, let me, like let me ask you. Why my bank account? Why it look yeah. like you can <laughs> dial my bank account? Who is it? Who is it? Oh, it's too much money, playboy. <laughs> <laughs> that is David in a nutshell. Yes, sir. So he walks up to me and he gets like, so imagine an instructor walking up to an E7 skinny kid. Um, I mean, it was me and he was like, he just he gets up in my face and kind of whispers, "Where the fuck did they dig you up from?" And I was like, "Oh, you know, I was like I lost a bet, you know, sorry." And he goes, "No, seriously, why, why were you before here? Like, what unit?" And I said, "Oh, uh, I was in I was in SF before here." And he goes, "You were in security forces, dude." I started laughing. <laughs> I I didn't know that was an acronym in the Air Force. I started laughing. I was like, "No, I was not a cop." Oh my god. And I think he cross trained, so it's kind of ironically funny. But uh, I mm-hmm. said, "No, I was in yeah, special forces." And he goes, "Hold on, you switched from the army?" I said, "Yeah, I was in second and the nineteenth, West Virginia Guard. I was in SF for, you know, over a decade. Kind of old, um, but yeah, that's where I came from. I'm with the New York Guard team now." And he goes, "Holy shit! Have you ever been to combat?" And I was like, "Yeah." And he goes, <laughs> "When was the last time you were in combat?" And I was like, I just got back like 10 days ago, literally. And he goes, from where? And I said, Iraq. He goes, what? Hold on. What? What are you talking about? So he, it was kind of funny, man. Each instructor had a really weird reaction uh, or conversation with me on that initial uh, intro. Well, but it's it the funny. biggest trap scenario, like, because you don't know what you don't know, right? So like, you, even like the cross trainee students, like I was at Indoc the first time I went with Roger Sparks. Roger Sparks oh, yeah. was busy. They read they read off the silver star that he got for Marine Force Recon work when we were there just on the pad one day. Like that tall guy walking into that into that indoc class, you don't you don't know. You yeah. don't have any ideas as an instructor. Like to get to get hit with the triple whammy of a guy that's been an 18 Delta and you know the civilian job that you had, like that's ridiculous. You can't 
you can't like deal with that. Yeah, it was pretty crazy. Uh, it was funny. I remember one time he was like, he's yelling. And then all of a sudden he locked eyes with me because he has a switch. Like every instructor has it, right? And as soon as the class walks over, mm-hmm. it, it gets flipped. So he basically lost his mind. He locks eyes with me and he goes, he, he said something like, uh, I can't remember what it was exactly, but it was something along the lines of, look, I've never been to combat, but if I have, I'm not taking any of you guys. And I was like, oh my goodness, I can't believe you just said that. And, and then we get smoked and then uh, we're about to go to our next event. So we're in formation. I was like, hey, Sergeant Keaton, can I talk to you for a second? He was, yeah, what is it? <laughs> and uh, so I was like, hey, can we go around the corner? And so I was like, man, these kids are 18 years old. Like they don't need to know what you have done and what you have not done. You just need to tell them what to do and when to do it. And that is it, man. Don't, he goes, yeah, but you're in the audience. I can't really say what I normally say. I was like, dude, do not worry about me, man. I'm definitely on your side on that one. Just do what you have to do for these kids and get them through. I- I'm going to do it from my that end. Is- you do it from your end. But uh, yeah, that, it was pretty yeah, funny. It's such a, like a, a unique scenario too. Like you have to just, you have to just accept that, right? Like it's, it's just the truth. So, so you get through the pipeline, you get out to New York, like you're hitting that first assignment up. You're still working. Are you still working the civilian gig on the side and then deploying yeah. with the the New York unit? Okay. Right. Uh, and what did you, uh, what did you get from your, you know, that first being a PJ, like you'd already graduated pipelines before you'd already accomplished so much. Like what was distinctive about that New York unit? You said that you loved it and you love working out there on strong Island with Macaulay and all them, them New York dudes. Oh yeah. Um, it, yeah, it was, what, uh, you, uh, what did you like about it? So just the personalities. I mean, I walked into the locker room and you hear about New York, but I, I'd never lived there. I'd never really visited there for too long. First guy I see in the locker room has got a shirt on. It says, fuck you, you fucking fuck. <laughs> and that's how they talked to <laughs> at the time. I'm sure it's a little different now, but uh, they just had this super aggressive attitude. Like everyone was super sure of themselves. A lot of experience. Like I said, a lot of Marine force recon, uh, Brian Mosier, JJ Baker, Jeff Green was a former controller. Eric Blom was, uh, I think he was from third bat, uh, from the army before he came over. Like it was just a super strong, a lot of alpha male, a lot of testosterone. It was awesome, man. It was a really cool team to be on. Um, well, and we had I, a blast I want to pause you there. there. I just want to pause you because yeah. I want to ask how, how is that different? Like you spent so much time in other team rooms, right? Like how is this PJ team room different than, you know, the 18 Delta and the 18 alpha team rooms that you were in before? So, uh, so on ODAs, there's, it, it seems like for the majority of the ODAs I was on half the team is that way, like super confident, super aggressive, and the, the junior half is kind of finding their way, trying to drill down on their job. Um, they're learning a lot. I mean, it's, it's like when I first got to my first ODA right out of the Q course, you know, you, there's a lot of uncertainty there. Um, you've got training, but those are your, that's when you were allowed to have training wheels. The training wheels come off when you walk in that team. It's like, holy crap, I've got to do my job here or find a new home or get fired or get lost. Uh, so there's a lot of work ahead of you when you when you first step in that team room. And I think that's that's the majority of PJs and CCTs. Um, you know, when they get out of that pipeline, there's a lot of learning that has to happen uh, as you get, you know, go through those first couple of deployments. Um, when I first got to ODAs, you know, it was it was the late 80s, early 90s. So imagine like there's not much going on. Like, and we went through the pendulum was swinging to, you know, Hey, we're going to send you on every trip. We got a ton of money to, Hey, can half of you leave the army right now? We'll give you bonuses to leave, you know, so back and forth. Uh, and then nine 11 happens and it's game on and it's stayed on for, you know, it'll be two decades next year. So, um, very different time to walk into different places. So, uh, I, I just thought it was a really cool intro to, to the air force to walk into like that mixed team, like a lot of branch transfers in there. And it was kind of, it made my transition easier being a former army guy. Right. And so how much time had you been in the military as a whole? You said you came in in 1988, right? And then you, uh, it was 86. Um, 
I was with a uh, mechanized <laughs> infantry unit while I was at NIMI. And then uh, I transferred to oh, okay. second of the 19th in May of 1988. Okay. So f almost 20 years by that point that you'd been associated with in some kind of unit. This guy, if, if you're ha was. not watching the YouTube video right now, go and check out the YouTube video. He looks like he's younger than all of us. He is the Wolverine. You remember that beginning scene in the Wolverine where he's like going through all the different wars and stuff and he still looks the same age. <laughs> that That is major Casey here. Oh, and then boy. the other thing to point out is just that you came in as an officer, you went back to enlisted and then you went to office. It was, it kind of, you went PA, which is an officer. And then you went back again to PJ, which is an enlisted. And then you went back again to this next thing, which is combat rescue officer. Yeah. I don't know how much time elapsed in between each one of those. It seems like probably every three to five years, you start to get the itch and you're like, I'm good enough at this job. I think I've experienced what I need to. And then you move on to the next thing. Um, you're, you're so, actually like, I'm actually I, mad I that we have you on here because people will, people will DM us and they'll be like, Hey man, listen, I want to be a seer guy first. And then I want to transfer over to PJ. And then I'm thinking about <laughs> being a doctor later. And we tell them the same thing all the time. We're like, listen, guy, you're talking about lifetime pursuits. Focus on one thing. You are now going to screw all of that up, RJ. Cause they're going to be like, well, RJ was a doctor and worked for the civilian super no. secret side. And then he did some other cool stuff. And then he was a PJ. Then he was Definitely a crow. Not. Then he was an army 18 Delta. Like you're the worst. Now I have to deal with you. Great. Yeah, Sorry about that. Did, did uh, you set out to do all these things when you initially started? No. Or was it just kind of like, oh, no. and, well, this, this job sounds cool. The disclaimer is if, if anybody told me that they did the things that I did, I'd be like, God, you're so full of shit. Just stop lying. <laughs> um, but I'm so old and I do have all the paperwork to back it up. But no, I think what <laughs> happened was I went into everything and I could not wait to do it. Like I could not wait to do that job. And then there would be at, at some point, whether it was, you know, not being able to being told you're never going to walk normal again or whatever, some reason I hit all these, you know, uh, forks in the road and each fork seemed to make sense to me. And I just did the best I could. And I tried to make the best decision. Uh, I didn't really think too much about the, the long-term effect, but the short-term effect of, you know, um, wow, I get to apply everything I learned in PA school as a PJ and I'm in a jump and dive billet. Uh, and I get to focus on medicine. This is awesome. You know, so it definitely was not about the rank. It was definitely about the job. Uh, and as I got older, um, you know, not that I wasn't already old, um, but you know, when you have your New York saying, team saying, RJ, we love you when you're here, but you're never here. You're red, you know, eight months out of the year, it seems like at least five. And that kind of makes us look bad. Why don't you go and uh, try the crow thing? You know, the reserves have part-time crows. You don't have to do it. It's not, they're not all full-time billets and their requirements at the time. And I think it was 2006. Um, there wasn't a lot of currency requirements for crows, not like the PJs. And they were like, you know, maybe if you have less requirements and you could do it as a crow, you were an officer before, you know, why don't you try that, man? And maybe it won't be so bad. I was like, yeah, I can do that. So, um, I, my initial, this plan is just a comedy of you getting suckered into things. <laughs> like you got suckered into Indoc, you got suckered into going back through the pipeline to go to crow. Like, this is just you. Like I, I imagine you in a room and you're like, yeah, that sounds like a good idea. And you walk uh -oh. out and the guys in that room are like, I can't believe you bit, man. He took oh the my bait. God. Yeah. He got him again. The only one who told the truth was that first recruiter. That was the only one who told the truth. <laughs> Since then, everybody's been big time. <laughs> you. You've, been getting You've been getting finessed for your 40 year career. Oh my God. <laughs> Um, but I think I think one of the important questions, though, and I'm going to ask it because, I mean, Brian and Aaron are obviously going to be biased and I would, you know, let Trent do it. But since he's not here, I mean, he loves PJs. He I mean, he's like a, he's a stage five clinger for PJs. <laughs> OK, he has but, PJ pajamas. Is yeah. <laughs> but so 18 Delta versus PJ. Mm -hmm. What do you think? So uh, I know on the civilian side, most people, uh, all things being equal, will lean towards the 18 Delta. And the reason is 
is because unless that PJ is doing something on the civilian side as a guardsman or reservist, if he's working in an ER or a hospital, that's different. If he's working in a family practice, anything medically, uh, he's a fireman and he's doing medicine. He's seeing patients every day. But mainly if they're in a hospital, that's different. Um, 18 Deltas are given the benefit of they do do clinical stuff. So when they're forward, you know, their job is point of injury medicine, obviously, you know, and trauma. Uh, and that's what the focus is for PJs, you know, point of injury, get him to a surgeon as fast as possible. Um, but the 18 Deltas, you know, when they're running a clinic and they're doing labs and they're doing stuff to keep guys healthy when they're sick, so they don't have to get shipped home. That's, that's a big deal over there. Um, I felt lucky to go to PA school after the 18 Delta course. Cause when I graduated the 18 Delta course, I was like, Oh my God, I don't know shit. Like, that's how I felt. I was like, I've got to dig into this medicine that's, stuff. I really, that is fantastic. You know, even after PA. Yeah. Even after PA stuff, like getting instructed at the apprentice course, uh, and Matt Fields actually ended up going to PA school later. Um, I just talked to him last year. He was one of my apprentice course instructors. And uh, some of the things, and, and I had Chris Perchecki in my class, thank God. Uh, so I had a lot of kids and then it was me and Chris. And obviously I'm older than Checky, but um, not by much. And so he was, he was working Albuquerque Fire for years. And after 9-11, he joined the Tucson Reserve Team. Um, and he came off the UK team with an injury. So he was a PJ on active duty, had a really bad knee injury, uh, got out of the military, was on Albuquerque fire for, you know, not quite a decade and then went back to the apprentice course. Um, so he and I were in the same class and we'd look at each other when we we're hearing what they were teaching and on breaks, if the instructor was cool, we'd be like, Hey, you know how you were saying this? I mean, this is another way to look at it. And we weren't saying he was wrong. Um, but there were definitely better ways to go about thinking through what your patient is about to go through what you can do on the ground, what you can do in the bird, what you can do to, for that patient before he gets to a surgeon. Um, there was kind of a lot missed there. So I, I know the course has changed. It's always evolving, always getting better. Um, so that's a good thing. But uh, I kind of felt lucky as a PA and having been on some of the trips I've been on to be in a class with kids just starting and to mentor them and to even mentor um like, you know, the guys that were about to get into our career field. Uh, and it, I know it was super frustrating for the instructors because 9-11 <laughs> happened. They were locked into uh, AETC, into this instructor billet, you know, and they were locked down for four years minimum. Uh, they mm -hmm. tried to get out at three, and I don't think very many escaped that fourth year. But they were super frustrated, especially, you know, some of their students had – you know, it, we're just coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan. They hated it. Um, Who did we so have on the were, show? Was it, I, I think was it Nate of, Cox that signed yeah, in it on, on 9-11-2001? On 9-11. <laughs> yep. Yep. And he was one of my apprentice instructors. He was, uh, dude, it, was it was interesting. I had a really good time with some of the instructors. Like, you know, I wasn't hanging out with them off duty, but on duty, it was really cool to talk to those guys and get to know them. And uh, in fact, after his podcast i watched it a couple of days after you guys released it and i called him because i found out where he was and uh because i i saw him at the pj rodeo at patrick and i want to say it was 2016 uh and we hadn't seen each other since the apprentice course so it was really cool to see him and i i called him um and i was like dude your podcast was awesome you nailed a bunch of stuff that everyone needs to hear before they get in this career field that was so cool uh, and I can't wait to see you again in San Antonio. So I'm um, looking forward to catching up with him again. And Gut, uh, Gutierrez down there, like they're around that uh, special warfare, you know, training group and training wing. Uh, there's a really good crew down there. So I'm pretty excited about there's this. There's goodness. Uh, Rebranding mm -hmm. going on. Yeah. 100%. So, man, that, that brings us all the way through that Enti entirely ridiculous and unbelievable story. I can't, I can't wait till I can like figure out that this is completely stolen valor the entire time. Like you heard it here first, everybody, we finally, we got him to out himself. We finally got him to, to go on record with this, but and then that brings us to now. And, you know, 
shout out to the t-shirt shout out to Briggins company and and what you guys are doing over at Briggins but you you got yourself in a, kind of that digital content realm and stuff and I just wanted to give you a little bit of time to, to talk about that project too because just like the rest of your history you are doing stuff that that hasn't really been seen before and integrating and, and engaging in spaces that hasn't really been explored before so I just wanted to turn it over and, and let you talk about Briggins for a little bit and talk about what you're involved with there yeah so uh, on the civilian so I'm Obviously, at Patrick, I'm a traditional reservist, so sometimes they have money for me to come in and sometimes they don't. Uh, COVID hits and everybody gets locked out and locked down. Mm. So, um, you know, you just can't sit around at home being bored. And uh, I had kind of, in New Smyrna Beach, I live in a really small little beach town, uh, surf town, and uh, it's about an hour north of Patrick. And one of the first military guys I met there was from, he had just gotten out of first ranger battalion. It was Connor Curtis and his brother, Dylan. They're both kids out of Fort Worth area, Texas, went to first ranger battalion. And while they were up there, they would come down to new Smyrna beach and surf because the, they were the closest, best waves on the East coast. And so after they got out, they ended up down there and their dad's this 30 year fire guy out of uh, uh, Dallas, Fort Worth airport. Um, they end up going to EMT school. I started talking to them about being a PJ because they were talking about paramedic. I was like, oh, this is a no-brainer. Check this out. Jump, dive, and and good sent to get paid to go to paramedic school. Um, but anyways, over the span of a couple of years, we, I thought they might need some help um, with their company. Uh, they didn't have a business license. They didn't have a bank account. They had an idea for actually this shirt. Uh, and we talked a lot about why they made this shirt and what it was all about and the ideas behind it. Uh, a lot of it had to do with integrity, uh, being the hardest working guy in the room service before self. Like they, everything they said was, I was like, man, that's spot on. The world needs more of that. So, um, I basically was like, Hey guys, you guys have been sitting on this company basically for, you know, a couple of years. Let me help you get it off the ground. Like, let's, let's do this. Um, bring me in as a partner. I will, you know, start your bank account. I'll get the business uh, license. I'll, uh, I'll get a website up and running. Uh, we'll do it together. It'll be awesome. It'll be fun. And let's spread this message, man. It needs to get out there. Um, you know, and they were just getting into the fire department. They were just starting their probation year. Uh, Connor's at Deland Fire, and Dylan is at New Smyrna Beach Fire Department. So, um, you know, they've got a pretty flexible job. You know, uh, I mean, their their shift is pretty good, so they can focus on brigands now. And so, I kept trying to say, like, really, at first, I just wanted one of their shirts, to be honest. And then we started talking and in between starting, you know, applying for a business license and being in the bank with the two of them, I got a call from a UK production company and they were like, Hey, we need your help with a Vietnam era movie. And then so immediately I realized, wow, we're going to have to do a lot of pre-production training. Uh, we're going to have to be on set. Uh, if we bring military guys in, they need to be part of the stunt team. They should probably be mentors for the principal actors uh, this is going to be bigger than just a one person military advisor for a movie. So, um, and then as soon as I got off the phone with him, I was like, Hey guys, what if, what if we're a consultant company? I think that the planet has enough cliche <laughs> military t-shirt companies. What well, let's, let's do something with this. Let's spread the message in kind of a different way, still make the shirts and and still, you know, advertise and do that stuff. But I really think you guys would be awesome for this next movie project. Um, I think you would be awesome once you get paramedic qualified to go to SpaceX, to go to some of these organizations uh, in the Virginia area. I think you could do a lot of things as a fireman uh, and not screw your department, but really you know, spread your wings and take some of this extrication on the road, take some of this point of injury medicine on the road and do some great things with it. And we could do it as a company and we could do it together whatever you guys decide, whether you decide to go into third battalion, 20th group as an 18 Delta up at camp landing, or you come down to my PJ team, you know, or you don't do either of those, you know, whatever you guys decide to do, let's just make it great. And 
let's just have a good time with it. And so that's kind of how we started the whole Briggins company. Um, and you know, you go to our website and it's, you know, it's pretty cool how they, uh, designed it and, and executed it. So yeah, glad you enjoyed it. Dang, that is, uh, so I know we can sit here and like talk about all the other things that you, you've done and all the missions like this. Literally, we just skimmed the surface and, you know, picked a couple um, super high value po- points in time in your life. Um, talking about transitioning through all these different things that you've done and, um, you know, are still continuing to do as you're still, you know, actively a crow. So super inspiring for me, um, you know, just listen to a person that has been doing all this stuff throughout their entire life. Just one goal after the next. We always say leave everything on the table and just, you know, what happens happens, but whatever that next goal is, you go hundred percent in on Absolutely. all that stuff. So, you know, all those guys that are just starting out, they're graduating high school or they're tired of whatever job they're doing, tired of college or whatever. What would you, um, your number one tip to get through, like what got you through all these different selections? Number one, number two, however many, you know, things that got you through at different points in your life, what would you say to them to try and help them get through? Okay. Uh, I'd like to manage all these kids expectations with a couple of things. One, uh, anytime I started to get cocky, man, the world and karma hit me square between the eyes. Never get cocky. (laughs) Stay humble. Um, you will get in trouble if you get cocky. It's a guarantee. At least in my case, that's been my experience. Um, I would say always keep your sense of humor. Um, and always try and help the people around you. Uh, you know, coming into the Air Force at the rank I was, I think it was always expected of me. But when you walk into a team uh, and you you get your stuff sorted out and you're comfortable where you're at, you know you have more to learn, um, start looking around because people need help. So, and that will take your mind off your worry. It will reduce your stress uh, and it will it'll, it'll hammer those basics into you. Uh, and so you're revisiting it and you're hearing it differently as you're teaching somebody and showing somebody and doing somebody. So anytime you can input all those things in all those different ways, you know, at the super basic level and you're helping somebody, I mean, that's, that's very satisfying. Uh, I think to most people, and it certainly was for me and being, um, you know, the NCO, I see of a, a, you know, an doc class or an apprentice course or going to a PJ team and just looking around a team room and seeing who the new guy is and who needs help. And, you know, Hey, don't worry about that. That that'll come with time to focus on this, you know, and, you know, trying to get people to avoid the mistakes you did. Uh, it's really easy to go through all these amazing courses to come off these historic missions, even from a reserve team, like our last deployment, it was amazing uh we had a great time um and we had a great trip uh, but to come off that and to get cocky and not think i can improve or i can do something better or hey there's what could i have done better on that trip that seemed to go you know as flawlessly as it could you know at least from our perspective uh there's always more to do and and more to improve on uh and you'll never i don't think you'll ever shoot enough. I don't think you'll ever do enough medicine. I don't think you'll ever jump enough. I don't think you'll ever extricate enough. Um, all those things just keep hammering, keep grinding. Uh, so I don't know. I, I think that would be a mindset to take into, you know, ANS and beyond. Um, and even now, like, what can I do for my team? You know, uh, I, I just got an email from, um, the tier one unit over in, uh, in the UK. And they're like, Hey, we really want to do something with you guys. Uh, so I connected them with my C2 element and I connected them also with third battalion 20th group. And I said, man, you have got to come to Florida and we need more of what you have. And apparently you're reaching out cause you need more of what we have. So we'll help you jump more. We'll help you do, you know, medical training more. We'll help you do personnel, uh, recovery better extrication better um we'll get you up with 20th group we'll do joint exercises uh i you'll just never stop learning and never stop doing i i I think when you sit there and go oh i've made it god past my uh, seven (laughs) level 
<laughs> have a run, peace out. You know, I'm going to be drinking over here. Tell me when you need somebody to, to be a rock star. I'm, I'm over here waiting to be a rock star. <laughs> like there's none of that. Do not wait around. Well, Stay on it. And you, you highlight something that we, we understand inherently, like the, the higher up that you get, it's like the old adage, like the older I get, the more I realize that I don't know anything. Right. It's like that inverse kind of relationship. You're talking about training yeah. at the highest level. And what you're talking about training is the basics. You're talking Absolutely. about like the world's the world's highest special operations forces. And you're saying the same thing that we say to every single person. If your buddy needs help, looks for work. Be so good at your job that you have the bandwidth to step back and help your team out. Some of the best advice I ever got on a team leader evaluation I got was a 2-4 operator was just kind of like watching me uh, over the shoulder. And he was like, hey, I know you're in your evaluation. Here's a nuance. When I give my team members a task, the last thing I ask him is, what, what do you need? You're telling him you have 10 minutes to do this task. He's like, follow up next time with what do you need? You would be surprised at how your team responds. It was one of the best pieces of information that I ever got, but it's all just basics. Yeah. You know, your That's entire true. career from, <laughs> from NIMI to 18 Alpha to 18 Delta to physician's assistant traveling around the world to PJ to back to the officer side of the crow to transition into the project with brigands you always focused on the basics and you were successful at, at each one of those things and that's an important message to leave everybody with is if you're just good at the basics and you care about your team great things are going to happen so rj thanks for coming on man i i appreciate you. you guys are doing big things down there in coco so gavin's down there joey's down there you guys are stealing talent <laughs> oh, yeah. i don't like it but i see you i see what you're doing right yeah, now there's good things happening in the important. melbourne area uh huh. Yeah, I see sure. it. I see it. It's between yeah, you. right now say, on, the, on that guard and reserve side. It's you and DM right now with the big names in the game. Yeah, definitely. But, uh, uh, hey. and, and for for the guys that are getting out, uh, there's so many things for you guys to get into these days uh, through this network, through every network you create and maintain. Uh, it's hard to lose touch with people now with all the smartphones and you know, contacts carry over. If your kid throws your phone in a bathtub, you don't lose the entire planet. Like it's backed up. Right. So, <laughs> um, make friends, uh, as you go. And, and as you're working with other units, especially so like that guy I went through ranger school with, like he and I still help each other out, like maintain those friendships. They're important. Uh, if you guys are looking for work, um, part-time here and there, short-term, long-term trips, Brigands Co. It's, uh, brigandsco.com that's our website uh hit us up on instagram it's uh at brigands underscore co so that's the one that uh connor and dylan maintain like they're all over those dms so reach out ask any question you want that's the best way to get a hold of me really so got it and we'll, we'll put it out i'll make sure that it goes into youtube and we'll make sure we put it out in the post so that everybody can find you but man from all of us in the team room rj thanks for coming on man we really appreciate it Hey, thanks for having me, and, and thanks for uh, for everything you do for all these kids, man. You are taking some of the guesswork out of it. Um, you are giving the kids a lot more answers to the test than they had. They still got to take the test, obviously. So, but uh, to have that Absolutely. knowledge, uh, there's you're managing their expectations before they walk in the door, and that wasn't happening when I first crossed over the Air Force. So, I really appreciate what you do for all of us. Thank you. Awesome always brother all right well unless anybody else has anything train hard earn each breath everybody we'll see you next time take care guys have a good one